are some things that I don't understand. Some things I can't come to grip with. Sometimes I just look out in the world and think, why? Why me, God? Why this situation? Why them, Lord? Why this tribulation? Why? Lips chapped, feet hurt in this weather. I thirst and I march on, hoping to find an answer. Just an inkling of faith in this world full of cancer would be a refreshing drip of water on the tip of my tongue. The fresh, cool breeze of Jehovah's lungs is exactly what I need. But that feels so far away. I mean, God, are you really with me? Do you really care? When I cry in distress, are you really there? Your word says yes, but sometimes I doubt it. But clearly my own path needs rerouting because every time I walk my own way, I get lost. And even though I'm lost in the desert, I now realize he created it. He knows where the water is. He made the sun. His creation is marvelous and he is in control even when I fail. He is faithful even when I fall. He is what I need even when I doubt. He is fresh water in the midst of the drought. He is God and he is king. He is Lord and gives life to all things. He gives and takes away and sometimes I just need to trust that he knows exactly what he is doing. When I am asleep, he is moving. When I fall, he is choosing to pick me back up with outstretched arms. Nothing that anyone does can separate me from his love because he is faithful. He is true. He is good. He is God. And in the desert, I know he reigns. Amen. I want to talk with you about faith. The Bible says, faith is a confidence in what is not seen. Ultimately, it's not just believing in the reality of God, but also believing in His goodness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to need you to believe me. (laughs) What I'm going to tell you is, with one arrow... I'm going to pop that balloon. How many people believe me? Look at all that faith. That's good faith right there. All right. I need a volunteer. The balloon's wiggling. There's ventilation up here. So of the people... That believe I will hit it in the first arrow. I need one of you to come up and hold the balloon. All right. With your teeth. Now, you can just steady it. All right. Now, use your other hand, too, to hold it so it doesn't wiggle. Are you ready? You guys ready? You're going to let me shoot an arrow at this guy? (laughs) Thank you. You guys are crazy. (laughs) Not one person said, no, don't do it. That was impressive faith. He he had enough faith that he was going to trust me even when there was risk. And that's the faith that we should have in God. It's so easy for us to say, God, I trust you when we're risking nothing. When we're not doing something difficult, we can sure say, but all of a sudden when there becomes risk, that's when our faith is truly tested. That's when we find out how much we trust God. Those tests, those trials are really an opportunity for us to put our faith completely in God. Now, the attitude and the action 
that prevents us from fully trusting in God is called doubt. The, the idea I want you to understand is sometimes there's a mistaken view of doubt. There are people that say doubt is the opposite of faith. That's not it. So uh, on this spectrum over here we have belief, absolute belief. On the other end is not doubt. What is over here? Unbelief, zero faith, complete faith, zero faith. What do we have all in the middle? We call that doubt. Now, this is encouraging for you. If you have doubt, the only way to have doubt is to move from unbelief and start believing. I've never met an atheist that doubts God. They don't have any faith to begin with. So ultimately, if you are having doubts, that is a sign that you have faith. Now, I've heard some people that would stand here, maybe you've heard, I have never once doubted God, they would say. But ultimately, if you're claiming to stand here, you're claiming to say you've got perfect faith. Now, can we have perfect faith in anything? Like, for instance, do you believe that you're wearing shoes today? I'm not even going to tell you how many people look down. <laughs> you have complete assurance that you're wearing shoes for many of you. And if you're not wearing shoes, you have assurance that you're not wearing shoes. Here's the point. When we're talking about God, we're talking about someone we've never seen. And by definition, we've got to understand faith never comes to the party by himself. Always brings doubt with him. That when we have faith, if we don't have perfect faith, and we don't have zero faith, anywhere on the spectrum, we have doubt. It should not surprise us that ultimately, even people of great faith have doubt. Now there are people, as I said, that say they've never doubted. I'm not one of those people. I can't say that I haven't had doubts. But what we can be encouraged by is that Jesus wants to help us overcome our doubt. Now it's important for us to realize there is a difference between a small doubt and a lot of faith, between that and a significant doubt with very little faith. So as I ask you to put yourself on this spectrum, do you have a lot of faith with a little doubt or do you have a lot of doubt with a little faith? So what's the difference? Obedience. Are you able and willing to obey God even when it gets tough? The road that God asks us to walk is narrow. The path is difficult. And when we're in a place and we're asking ourselves, do I really trust God? The question is, are you obedient? Because many times when you're not obedient, it's a reflection of doubt. And if you have a lot of doubt, you're going to have a lot of disobedience. What we're going to look at today, we're going to look at the example of a phenomenal believer, John the Baptist. And we're going to see that even he had doubt. So if you have a copy of God's word, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 11. In this first book in the New Testament, we're going to see John the Baptist at his lowest point. John the Baptist was a prophet and not just any prophet. John the Baptist was the best. He was faithful, selfless. Loyal, but he also had doubt. If you found the place, and as you are able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's holy written and errant word? Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing the 12 disciples, 
he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Would you pray with me? Father, we confess that there are times where we have doubt. But Lord, we're comforted that even the best believers will have doubt. So Father, I pray whether we're standing here now with a small amount of doubt or a significant amount of doubt, that, Lord, it would please you to help us understand how to overcome our doubt. Lord, that is our prayer, and we ask it in Christ's name. God's people said, thank you. You may be seated. In case you are unsure that John the Baptist was a champion of faith, Take a look at verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those who are born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said that just minutes after John came and sent his disciples said, Are you the Christ? It was a technical term. Are you the coming one? Are you the Messiah? For John to look at Jesus and say, I don't think you're the guy. But yet Jesus said, there has never been at this point someone better than John the Baptist. Now hear me on this. If the best, the best can have doubt, how much more can you and I have doubt? The interesting thing to me, when John came to Jesus, sharing his doubt, Jesus could have just said, okay, John, you don't believe in me, you don't think I'm the guy, go pound sand. Could have told him that, but he didn't. He told John's disciples, tell John, hear what I'm doing. He was looking to help John gently overcome his faith or overcome his doubt. I wrote this down in your notes. Inside your bulletin, there's an opportunity for you to jot some notes down. Cross the top of the page. This is the main idea. Jesus will help me overcome any doubts. Jesus will help me overcome any doubts. Right across the top of the page. If you get this one thing, you pay for your gas this morning. Jesus will help me. Overcome any doubt. So it's like this. John had doubt. Jesus went to help him overcome it. Interesting thing to me is Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record the cause of John's doubt. And really that's where we begin. If you are struggling with doubt, we begin by looking to the cause of our doubt. I wrote this down for point number one. This will be up on your screen. I can realize the cause of my doubt. That's where you start. Doubt does not happen in a vacuum. Doubt happens for a specific cause. And we will see by John's own testimony that he has good reason for doubt. What are the reasons that John had doubt? What do we see? Look again in the text. In verse 2. Now when John heard where? In prison. How many of you have been to prison? 
Don't raise your hand. I've been to prison a couple times, a supermax facility in Indianapolis. It was a nice prison. I was visiting. I wasn't incarcerated. But, man, it was nice. This is not the prison John was in. John was held in a prison right off the Dead Sea, and it was in a dark dungeon. And John had been in that prison not for just a weekend, and after a weekend he says, I just can't believe. He was in there almost two years at this point. And it didn't ultimately get any better for John. So what we can see is there will be doubt from, I wrote this down, letter A in your notes, from my experience of personal tragedy. Doubt can come from my experience with a personal tragedy. What John was ultimately saying is, I didn't expect it to go down like this. Uh, You know, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing exactly what God has asked of me. Then all of a sudden, here I am in prison. Ultimately, We can have situations like that where we're in a place and we just don't understand why. Some of you have been given terrible diagnosis. Some of you have suddenly lost friends or family. When we experience tragedy, doubt is not far behind. It's just very easy for us when we're in a situation that is not comfortable for us to start doubting. Because ultimately we know God is good. And we know God is great. So if anything happens in our life, God had to allow it. And if God allowed it, what's going on? Because this is not good. Some of you would say, you know, This in my life is not good. So you either start doubting God's existence or God's righteousness. It's easy to do. Ultimately, David gave a picture of what this type of attitude would look like. I wrote this verse in your notes, Psalm 69. David speaking, saying, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. Have you been there? Are you there now? There are times when personal tragedy comes And it's reasonable to have doubt. It is not to say that that excuses our doubt, but there is a reason. And when we know the reason, that helps us to learn how to get past it. And I've seen many of you do that. I've seen many of you, in tragedy, still look up and say, God is good. And that's inspiring. People take note when you're in difficult circumstances and can still say God is good. And ultimately, we have this opportunity to look into our situation. And even though we're facing tragedy, we can stop and say, yes, God is even good here and now. That's what Job did. Job ultimately, uh, to give you a little context, Job ultimately just basically lost everything. A servant came to him and said, hey, I just lost all your donkeys. While he was still speaking, another servant came in and said, hey, we lost your sheep and all the servants except for me. Another servant came in while he was still speaking and said, we've also lost your camels. One more guy comes in and said, we've lost your sons. We've lost your daughters. That's Where Job was when he says these words. I wrote it down in your notes. Job chapter 1 verse 20. Then Job arose and tore his robe. Shaved his head. Fell on the ground and worshipped. He said naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. 
The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I don't know if I have that much faith. Do you? To ultimately lose everything. Because when we are in a point where we would lose everything, that's where John the Baptist was. He had no freedom. Ultimately, his head was going to be removed. And he had doubt. And that's understandable. But there was also another reason for John's doubt. You look again in the text. He says, obviously, that he was in prison. It says, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word from his disciples and said, are you the one who is to come? What can we learn about that? We first see that he had an experience of personal tragedy. He was in a situation that was bad. But yet, he still heard about what Jesus was doing. His disciples came and said, Jesus did this, Jesus did that. And then he said, are you the coming one? Why would John know what Jesus is doing, look at his works and still question whether he was the Messiah? Because the work that Jesus was doing was not expected by the popular vote. I wrote it down this way. Another reason for doubt is from my reliance on popular theology. If I start getting what I know about God by what's popular, guess what? What's popular is not always and if rarely right. And if you start believing something that is not right, and then something else happens, what do you get? You get doubt. So what was the popular theology according to the Jews about what the Messiah would do? The Messiah would come and he would set the captives free. And so all the Jews thought that when Jesus or the Messiah comes, he's going to throw off the Roman Empire. And so John is sitting in prison and he's saying, okay, Jesus is going to cast off the Romans and I'll probably get out. But he hears Jesus continually telling his disciples to submit to the Roman Empire. He said, this can't be the Christ. They expected the Christ to come and judge the guilty. But Jesus taught grace for everyone. Now, ultimately, the problem in their theology was Jesus was coming to set us free from sin, not from the occupation that Rome had over them. Jesus was coming to ultimately make our lives better because healing, our biggest need. But when I stop thinking about God for who he is and start thinking about God for what people say he is, that's the recipe for doubt. Now, does it still happen in our day and time? What's a popular thing to believe right now that will lead to doubt? Certainly. And we, we, say, we hear this quite a lot. God will never put more on you than you can handle. We hear that in popular theology, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So if you're a good person and bad happens, what's going on, God? What's going on? Ultimately, another popular point of theology is to believe that God always wants you to be wealthy and healthy. Have you heard this? If you just have enough faith, you can drive a BMW and never get sick. And they're preaching this. And if you buy into that and then all of a sudden you don't drive a BMW, what happens? You get to doubt your own faith and you get to doubt God. But that's not the truth. So when we are in a position of doubt, you need to stop and reflect are you relying on popular theology? 
Now, ultimately, the first thing that Jesus wanted to do is help realize the cause of doubt. And John had reasons, two big ones. There are more reasons why you might doubt, but just for John, those were the two main. But I'll give John some really credit. He really has credit because when he had doubt, where did he go? He went to Jesus. I wrote this down for point number two. I should reach out to Christ with my doubt. So first, you realize the cause of your doubt. Second, you reach out to Christ with your doubt. Now, I don't know about you, but the last place I often want to go with my doubt is to God. I mean, if I start doubting, it's just like I don't want to even go to talk to God. You know, maybe it's guilt, maybe it's shame. Is it like that for you? Do you find yourself in a time of doubt and the very thing that you ought to do, which is go to God, is something that you just don't end up doing? Well, what John demonstrated is an important principle that when we have doubt, we need to take it to Jesus. Now, ultimately, John came to Jesus through his disciples. How do we take it to Jesus? Yeah, I wrote this down. I can get encouragement through prayer. I can get encouragement through prayer. Psalm 18, another psalm of David In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. For his temple, from his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Ultimately, we have to be careful. If we just view prayer as a means of getting what we want from God, we're missing out on what God wants prayer to be. I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask God for big things. You know, I'm a father, and my children sometimes ask me for big things. Uh, One time I remember one of my daughters, I won't tell you which one, she really fell in love with Ariel the mermaid. Really fell in love with Ariel the mermaid. We had a little pool in our backyard, and she often asked me, to glue her legs and feet together so she could be a mermaid. Not just once. And so here it is. She came to dad with a big ask. You know what dad did? No, I didn't put glue, but I got some tape. And I taped her legs together like she wanted. And, you know, she smiled. It was great until she realized she couldn't walk. And then my wife saw it. She didn't think it was funny at all. But yes, when we come to God the Father, we can say, God, I have a big ask here. But that's not the only thing with prayer. If the only thing is prayer is coming to God with what we want, we're treating God like a a genie or a vending machine. When we come to God through prayer, what we're realizing is that in that we have a great thing, which is fellowship with God. Because when we have doubts, we come to God in prayer and we say, God, I've really got a problem here, but I know you can solve it. God, I'm really going through a difficulty right now, but I know you're going to make the difference. The Bible says, I wrote this down in your notes, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. That we come to God, not just with the grocery list, But when we come to God, we say, God, here is everything that I'm worried about. Here's all the problems. Here's my doubt. 
and we lay it down to Him. Because when we come to God in prayer, that's where we get the encouragement. And I would bet that the very presence of doubt is indicative of the diminishment of prayer. If you have a lot of doubt, you're probably not praying very much. Now, some would say, well, obviously, if you're not doubting, you're not going to pray much, but it's not that. When you stop praying, you start doubting. When you regularly spend time with God, you are reminded that He is real and He is good. So when we start experiencing doubt, whether small or whether significant, we need to remember we got to reach out to Jesus through prayer. But there's something else, and we can't miss this. Look again in the text. John came to Jesus through his disciples, which was great. Jesus was compassionate. Now listen to what Jesus said. Verse 4, Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, leper. He goes through this list. Why? Why does Jesus enumerate all these specific things? Because those things were what the Bible said the Messiah would do. In the book of Isaiah, these specific things were told. So when John heard the word of Christ, he's reminded, oh wait. Yeah, I've been thinking the Messiah is going to do all these things. But I'm reminded that the Bible said he's going to do all these things. So I wrote this down. I find exhortation in Scripture. When you're going through doubt, you find exhortation in Scripture. When you're in a situation you don't know what God's doing, when you find yourself in doubt, pull your Bible out. When you're in a situation that you don't know why, you don't know how, come back to the Word of God. Because that's where He wants us to learn the truth. You know, many times we hear things about God that frankly aren't true. But as much as we come back to the Word, that's what we find out is true. Ultimately, we need to go back to the book of instructions. I bought a new swing for the playground we have at our house. I bought this swing because one of the swings broke. No big deal came in the mail, and I go out, and I start putting it up. My son comes out. He looks at the swing, looks at me, and he starts digging in the box. He pulls out a little piece of paper, and he said, Daddy, did you read the manual? <laughs> and I looked at him like any father. I say, hey, when all else fails, we'll read the instructions. Now, I'm not always like that. I mean, I certainly read the instructions on important stuff, but putting a swing up, I mean, right? But here he is. He's watching me put this swing up, and it's not happening like he thought it should. So he's looking at this, and he's kind of pointing. But I got it up fine. It's still there. You can see it. But here's the thing. How many times are we like that? When all else fails, read the instructions. If we keep ourselves in the book, that's where we're going to find the real instructions. One of the best examples, one of the best examples where there was doubt because of something that happened that was beyond expectation But the very thing that happened was already in the book. The biggest example where I see people plagued with doubt because something happened that the Bible already said was going to happen was when Jesus was crucified. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to be, he's going to be gone. He was going to die. And then when he did, What did the disciples do? 
wasn't just Thomas that had doubt. They all had doubt, and they all had difficulty. But then when Jesus showed up, what did he do? And I wrote this down in your notes. Luke chapter 24. Jesus speaking to his disciples, he said, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead. And repentance and forgiveness of sin shall be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You see, the disciples had doubt because they didn't understand what happened. Even though Jesus told them it was going to happen. But I'm, I'm not much better. How many times do I get discouraged because I, I don't like what might happen. But ultimately, I should have known it was going to happen. You know, oftentimes when we hear the Bible say that in the world you will have tribulation, we know that. We know that's in the book. But we think that means other people. Sorry about you, but you're going to have tribulation sometimes. But for me, not so much. That's what we think. And so as we remind ourselves what's in the Bible, that's where we get to the point of getting past our doubt. Let's review. Main idea I wanted you to get from this is Jesus will help me overcome any doubt. How do we do that? I can realize the cause of my doubt. I can realize the cause of my doubts. Some, it's doubt from experience of personal tragedy. When bad things come, we can have doubt. Also, it can come from reliance on popular theology. We have doubt because people tell us what's going to happen, and they're wrong. Secondly, I should reach out to Christ with my doubt. I need to reach out. Whenever I've got doubt, I need to come to Jesus and bring it to Jesus. I get encouragement through prayer, letter A. And there is exhortation in Scripture, letter B. One last thing, and I'll close. The last thing Jesus said to the disciples of John, you see in verse 6. A gentle rebuke. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. What did Jesus mean? Ultimately, this is the form of a beatitude. Makarios, blessed or happy is the person who is, uh, the original Greek word was the idea of being trapped, uh, to fall into a trap. So happy is the person that doesn't fall in a trap because of me. In other words, I'm going to be best off when I don't fall into doubt. If I can live my life without falling into doubt, that's the best thing. I wrote it down this way and I close with this. My life is always better when I can believe. My life is always better. Blessed are you if you can stay away from the trap of doubt through the things that are going on in your life. The Bible says with this, and I'll close with this verse, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Would you pray with me? Father, we do confess at times in our doubt, we don't often come to you as we should. Father, we, we might be neglecting prayer and we might be neglecting the time in your word. And it causes us to have doubt. Lord, right now I pray for everyone here everyone that's watching at home that, 
that today, Father, we could make a choice to put more trust in you. Even though we might have doubts that we would leave here with a decision to put more faith in you. Father, that's our prayer. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.